I think the speakers were all terrific and raised a lot more questions than anybody who has any um, things they want to ask. This is your opportunity. Just write the questions on cards. There's a place in the back to do that and uh, turn them in and we'll try to address every question we can. <clears throat> the first thing I wanted to do was to share with you something that somebody wrote on a question card that isn't actually a question. All speakers were very informative, easy to understand, seemed truly concerned about us, and just top-notch in raising awareness and telling us what we wanted to know and needed to know about net cancer. Thank you to Marianne and Bob so much for setting up this conference and for the awesome speakers, uh, accommodations, vendors, and over-the-top wonderful food we have enjoyed. It was great. Thank you. So I just wanted to share that with everybody. And I want to personally thank uh, Bob and Marianne for this amazing job as well. Thank you. Okay, let's just see what's going on here. Okay, so let's just jump in. Okay, a question addressed to Dr. Eyre. Who will have access to my DNA? Will it ever be traced to my family? So the samples will be anonymized once we get them. And uh, therefore, unless there was a very specific reason that the family members were looking to ask, you know, what happened, I want to check something in dad's DNA and dad's not alive or something like that. That would be an unusual circumstance, but, but no one would know that it's yours. Um, we have a Roswell Park ID number that would be created for patients that are not from Roswell, and then that would be the tracking number to track the person. So um, there is a center, it's called a center, um, it's called CDN, and uh, they act as the honest brokers. Basically, they keep everything anonymized. Thank you. Okay, here's a question addressed to Dr. Howe. Is there a link between high cholesterol and pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors? My surgeon is tracking my cholesterol without explanation, and I want to know why. Not to my knowledge. There's does anybody have any idea of why a surgeon would be tracking cholesterol? I'm not sure. Certain uh, medications like Everolimus can raise cholesterol and it's uh, triglycerides. It's appropriate to measure lipids from time to time. But I'm not sure why somebody, why a surgeon would specifically be checking cholesterol. I can see a medical oncologist might be interested, but not a surgeon. Okay, is there any known connection between neuroendocrine tumors and fibromyalgia? Who wants to take that one? Victor Howe. What was the question? A connection between neuroendocrine tumors and fibromyalgia. Again, not to my knowledge. Dr. Iyer? So I think that there are, all of us have seen this anecdotally, that there is some correlation with um, rheumatological conditions or other inflammatory conditions. and. What is the real relationship? What proportion of fibromyalgia patients have this, or what proportion of neuroendocrine patients have, let's say, lupus? Is it just a random coincidence? This is something I'm hoping this registry will help us, you know, know. And I think one other thing I should mention, here I am talking to patients who have the diagnosis. We hope also to approach different organizations that, let's say, are fibromyalgia support groups or rheumatoid arthritis support groups and, and, and ask them, do you have patients that have this diagnosis? Would they be interested? And I think that will help us learn. There, there are people with carcinoid syndrome who do complain of musculoskeletal complaints, and it's not clear exactly whether that's related to mediators produced by the tumor or exactly what the cause is. There also are some people who experience um, some musculoskeletal complaints associated with somatostatin analogs like octreotide or lanreotide, but uh, this really hasn't been very well worked out. There's a severe neuromyopathy which can rarely develop as a, a complication of having neuroendocrine tumors where you have weakness in your muscles in the legs and um, it can, uh, it's not exactly like um, 
myasthenia gravis, but it's it's a similar concept that you end up with weakening of your muscles and uh, mediated by problems happening in the nerves. But that's very, very rare, and we don't usually see that. Uh, the last few years, I learned more and more say, how much we don't know about this particular disease. I think the neuroendocrine tumor is the nerves, or the cell can make so many different hormones, we are not smart enough to figure that out yet. And I'll tell you a few, few examples. I had operated on a lady from New Mexico to a husband, and, her, and a patient come back to visit me about a month ago. And the husband told me, he says, thank you so much for bringing my wife back of 10 years. I said, what do you mean? He said, my wife has never acting like this for the last 10 years. And whatever you did, she become a different person, come back to the, the 10 years you know, ago of her. And so in, in other words, the tumor must be producing in her system, producing some kind of weird stuff, make her personality completely change for the last 10 years. She's been a nurse, she keeps trying to find reason not to do active duty, ask her nurse to give her easier, easier assignment. But after surgery, she becomes a different person. She asks her nurse, say, assign her more duties. She'd like to get more involved and, and, and more, more direct. I have a few patients say they was very de depressed before I did my surgery, and I did the debulking. They say, I'm no longer depressed. I say, I've done, done nothing to do with your depression. I just removed your tumor. So apparently, there's uh, so many different hormones have been producing by this tumor. We're just not smart enough to identify every one of them. Yet. What Dr. Wang says is certainly um, well known, and it's actually remarkably common. Um, a lot of hormones are certainly made that aren't known, but even what is known, which is serotonin, uh, when brain serotonin is low, people tend to be extremely depressed, which is why the so-called SSRI medications raise brain serotonin. When people have carcinoid syndrome, you use up all your tryptophan, which is the um, amino acid that makes serotonin, you use it up to make serotonin in the body and it doesn't leave enough to make enough serotonin in the brain. So when people have carcinoid syndrome, which is severe, you have high serotonin in the blood and low serotonin in the brain and very often people become depressed and have all kinds of neurologic and psychiatric manifestations of their disease and there's certainly plenty of people who were misdiagnosed with all kinds of psychiatric problems for years before they ever made their diagnosis diagnosis properly of carcinoid, as Dr. Wang said, so I think that's very good. Yeah, um, and also I saw about 10 patients was on four different hyper, anti-hypertensive medicine before surgery. After the surgery, they off medicine completely. Okay, um, here's one for Dr. Howe. If a patient uh, with pancreatic neuroendocrine tumor is not familial, what are other possible causes? Is genetic testing necessary or financially possible? Or should it be done in everybody? How do you decide who to test? Well, uh, I, I think that's a great question. We, we don't know in these sporadic cases uh, what is causing, uh, causing these uh, tumors to form, uh, whether it's some environmental influence uh, or whether there are certain familial situations we just don't know about yet. Uh, you know, all those things could be active. As far as when to get genetic testing, you know, clearly if multiple family members are affected with neuroendocrine tumor, then there's a high likelihood that there may be something in the family. Or if you, say, have a pancreatic neuroendocrine tumor and your mom had kidney stones, that might be suggestive that you could be an MEN1 family. So the, you really look, have to look at the other components uh, of some of the syndromes that we talked about, MEN1 with pituitary or parathyroid disease in addition to pancreas, or say if a family member had kidney cancer uh, or you know weird uh, history of brain surgery, which if you reviewed the records was a hemangioblastoma of the cerebellum. You know those are things that would really uh, suggest that the family should be tested. Whether every individual with a pancreatic neuroendocrine tumor should be tested, I would say probably not, but anybody certainly who has an early age of onset, say before age 30 or 40, then they're more likely to have a familial condition. Okay, so here's for everybody. How is progression-free defined? How can it be determined with such precision if scans are only done once per year? 
I'm not sure quite right where that once per year came from, but who'd like to uh, address this issue? Um, so pr progression free, there's, there's two definitions of progression free. Um, one is when you're on a clinical trial, we use this term progression free survival. So that is very tightly monitored and very clearly reported. And that is from time of enrollment, your baseline scan, subsequent scans done at X interval, which is every eight weeks, every 12 weeks. And then you're comparing the size of the tumor and the changes, and you a priori decide which ones you're going to use as target lesions and follow. And that progression, more than 30% growth, is called progression for a clinical trial. However, in real life, for many of you, for many patients, you're not on a clinical trial. And the scans, the, like you pointed out correctly in your question, some patients are getting scans every six months or every year. So it depends on what the disease burden is, is kind of what will, and what therapy you're on, will determine how often your scan is done. So for example, someone that has one little lymph node, we're not even sure what it is, that person may be getting scans once a year. So for them, you don't worry that this is going to progress as quickly and you worry about doing too many scans, so you do them six monthly at first and then annually. So what you're looking for is lack of progression, meaning things staying stable. And for that individual, because of the low burden, your pretest probability or your suspicion is low, so your scans are less frequent. Whereas for someone else who's on, let's say, timozolomide, capecitabine, disease burden is kind of, you know, more, um, well, obviously their progression will be measured on a scan more frequently. And that is not, when you're not on a clinical trial, that is not as strictly regulated, uh, meaning the oncologist and the radiologist have to look at the scans themselves and say, yes, it looks like it's moved, there's more spots, or the patient's not tolerating this therapy very well. And those are other ways that someone would maybe change therapy. So, so bottom line, progression-free survival is not a term that has any relevance in uh, practical care of patients. It's a term that's specifically for formal research studies. And a patient has scans, as um, we heard, every 12 weeks or every uh, eight weeks, depending on how the study is done. And progression is determined to have an increase in the size of the uh, aggregate of the tumors measured by the largest uh, single dimension in each tumor has to increase by 20% before it's called progression. If it increases by 18%, it's called stable disease. These are concepts that are not part of normal management of patients. It's a research concept. So I think that if tumors are a little bit bigger, you need to have a discussion with your treating doctors about whether the tumor is getting bigger, whether it's getting worse, whether treatment needs to be modified or changed. And the term progression-free survival is a really a research term. So when you're reading papers in the literature, you'll see that all the time. But when you look at studies, um, it's uh, it's different than what happens in the real world. Okay, um, I guess this is a question for Dr. Ho, or Dr. Uh, Howe. Are there any docs besides Dr. Wang using dye? If not, why? Um, there's nobody that I know of other than Dr. Wang uh, who's doing this. Um, I think most of us think that we can assess the lymph nodes at risk and the bowel that's at risk by uh, palpation and, and by looking at the distribution of the, the mesenteric nodes that are enlarged. I mean, I, I commend Dr. Wang for his, uh, you know, trying to push things forward by doing this mapping technique. I clearly have used it on hundreds of my patients with melanoma and I'm familiar with it, so it's not a lack of familiarity, it's just uh, a practical issue where I'm not sure it would change my management. Do you know of any other people who are doing this, uh, Dr. Wayne? I don't know if I heard a few of that try it. Okay. Um, here's another one. After a distal pancreatectomy, what are the possible complications that could arise in the future? Ah. Well, so, and I didn't talk much about diabetes, but clearly anytime you resect pancreas, since it makes insulin, uh, the more pancreas you resect, the less insulin producing cells you have. Normally though, these tumors are kind of large and the area of the tumor isn't making any insulin. So 
you may only take an extra one to two centimeters of normal pancreas, and so much of the time you're not really getting rid of a lot of insulin producing cells. That being said, though, if, if people are borderline diabetic, by doing a pancreatic resection you may you know, tip them into full diabetes, so that's clearly one of the biggest things you need to worry about. I didn't discuss this either, uh, and that's the issue of pancreatic insufficiency. Um, sometimes when you take out a lot of the pancreas, there, you can't make the enzymes that help you digest food as much. And so, and this is a common thing on anybody who's on somatostatin analogs as well. It suppresses the enzyme production from the pancreas, and so people often have to take digestive enzyme supplements like Creon. Uh, we have a lot of people who take papaya because it's more convenient and cheaper, which is another pancreatic enzyme substitute. So those are long-term effects. The short-term complications are really leak from the cut edge of the pancreas. Even if we staple and oversew it and you don't think it could possibly leak, it still can. Those enzymes are pesky and they can find their way out of the duct. Um, but most of those don't need reoperation. And then splenectomy which is often associated with the distal pancreatectomy. You know, it's very important that people receive preoperative immunizations, and if they don't get them post, preoperatively, they should get them a few weeks postoperatively. These are uh, immunizations to Haemophilus influenza type B, meningococcus and pneumococcus, which are different bacteria that the spleen is especially effective at helping you uh, fight off. Um, and then the other thing to recognize, if you're missing your spleen, that uh, old red blood cells won't be broken down in the spleen. So they'll be floating around your circulation. And when people look at your peripheral blood smear, it'll have these uh, cells that look abnormal. But they'll just pop on their own, and, and usually there's no problem from that. Yeah, in my, in, in my experience, the tumor in the tail of the pancreas, especially the tumor is big enough, they are already obstructed pancreas duct, so the distal pancreas atrophy. So even before surgery, that part of pancreas has been removed is not working anyway. So most of the time, you remove the tail of the pancreas, don't make any much difference at all. It's, as long as you have a healthy pancreas, most of the literature say you have 80% of pancreas removed, you still have normal life, unless you have a pancreas disease deficiency to begin with, and then remove part of the pancreas while causing some problem. And also, the 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 enzyme deficiency and enzyme production is much more less in the tail of the pancreas. So distal pancreatectomy usually, in general, is pretty safe. So when we give you a choice of what the, the tumor at the body of the pancreas, we try to do a distal pancreatectomy instead of trying to do a web ball to, to remove the, the, the head part of the pancreas. We always try to do the distal part for that reason. Okay, thank you. The next question uh, has a medical component and also a uh, Gary, um, a Gene Lovelace component. So why don't we start with uh, with Gene since he hasn't had an opportunity to say too much in the discussion session. If you're experiencing anxiety or depression, are there drugs or which drugs are okay to take? Can you safely take SSRIs with carcinoid syndrome? And I think in general it raises the issue of how do you deal with anxiety and depression. So did you have anything you wanted to say about that before we talk about the drugs? Well, I know, um, pay attention to your physician and your pharmacist, and they'll give you good advice about the pharmaceuticals. I do know that in hospice care, one of the first things our docs do is look at, look at what all folks are taking. <clears throat> Many times nobody's, like we go in a home and look, and there's a dishpan full of medicine that's been prescribed sometimes for 10 or 15 years. And so the first thing they do is reduce pill burden and reduce some of the medications that they're on and the complications of, of taking all of them. I think sometimes depression and, uh, and, and anxiety can create, be created by folks who lose hope. And I think that's one of the big things, I, I, listening to my doc friends, they do not want to do that. They do not want to diminish hope. So sometimes they don't have a conversation with patients because to say to them, I can't cure this, or there seems to be that line out there that you're walking toward, they don't have the conversation because they don't want to reduce hope. And so my message would be that, that uh, hospice care, or end of life care, is not a reduction of hope. It's just deciding a different path to walk down. 
and uh, many times that can help with a lot of our anxiety and our depression. Uh, a lot of folks say just getting things in order and having a conversation diminishes my anxiety and my depression. Thank you. Any strong feelings about SSRIs? Um, not so much. Uh, I think <coughs> I wanted to make a point uh, that there are many alternative ways to manage anxiety. I went to a lecture once by a psychologist and she stood up with a glass of water that was half full. And she said, I know what you guys are thinking. That's not the question I'm going to ask. I'm going to ask you, how much does this glass weigh? And it's, it's easy to guess someone's weight, like a person, but it's hard to guess the weight of something that small. So people guessed whatever, you know, 10 ounces, something, some grams. And she smiled and she said, you know, you all are wrong. If I have to stand here with this glass for the whole hour of this talk, it would be, the weight of this thing would be a lot. But if you told me I can't put this down for 24 hours, it would be unbearable. I, I would not be able to stand there holding this for a whole hour. And if you told me you cannot put this down for a whole week, I would kill myself. I wouldn't be able to do it. I would not function. And anxiety is like that. If you don't put it down, you know, for an hour you think about something, it's, it's hard. 24 hours of thinking about something can be unbearable. And if you cannot move it and lose it for a whole week, you will not function. And that goes for everybody, regardless of what the diagnosis or the thing that's making you worry and be anxious is. So I never stop thinking about that story. And when I catch myself, you know, worrying about something that I cannot control, I distract myself and say, I need to go do something else. I need to put that glass down. So that's just a small, but hopefully a message that you'll remember if you're dealing with this. That's very nice. Um, thank you. Um, SSRIs work by raising the level of serotonin in the brain, which makes depression better. And most of the time, it doesn't have any effect on people's carcinoid syndrome, since the serotonin compartment in the brain and the serotonin compartment in the body are separate. There's a so-called blood-brain barrier that keeps the serotonin from going back and forth between the brain and the body. However, there are a few patients where it does get through enough brain, uh, blood brain barrier can be disrupted and uh, in, with cancer, who knows what might be doing it, but some people have a severe reaction and I've seen people have a, uh, just a fulminant carcinoid crisis from taking one pill of an SSRI. And I have other people who have been on these medications for years with no problem. So I think the most important thing is your psychiatrist or um, internist or whoever is prescribing the SSRI should know that you have carcinoid syndrome, know that an um, adverse reaction is possible if there's an alternative medication that does the job, use an alternative medication, and if you need an SSRI, just start carefully with a low dose and escalate and just watch, and if you're tolerating it well, and in fact it's making you feel better from the resolution of the depression, it's okay. It's not a rule that you can never take it if you have a diagnosis of carcinoid, but you do have to be careful. Okay, um, next. Um, is it likely for a breast metastasis from a net to have estrogen, presumably they mean estrogen receptor, and still be a neuroendocrine tumor? Um, so I, um, I think I'm classifying everything. So two answers. Um, your question perhaps is about a neuroendocrine metastasis to the breast, so the cancer has been diagnosed as a low-grade or high-grade neuroendocrine cancer. So there we generally would not do the receptor testing for ER and PR because it's not expected. It's a neuroendocrine cell. We don't think the origin of it is breast tissue per se. So that's one answer. The second is sometimes there are breast cancers that have neuroendocrine differentiation. That means they've become a little bit more aggressive. So in those cases, yes, those cells could still express ER and PR. But generally when cells become more neuroendocrine-like or more aggressive, 
the therapies that are chosen are not going to be hormonal at that point. What's really driving that cancer's growth is some other, other genetic abnormality or, or signaling pathway. And chemotherapy would generally be used in that situation more so than hormones. But if someone's already on, let's say, tamoxifen, they'd probably continue it. Odds are they'd probably continue it. So I hope that answers your question. So thank you. So breast um, carcinoid tumors exist, although they're uncommon as primaries. More commonly, you can have breast metastases from carcinoid, and they're actually showing up pretty frequently. I probably have 30 patients who have breast metastases from intestinal carcinoids or pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors. We're finding them even more commonly now that we're doing gallium-68 PET imaging, and it's just one of the places where metastases happen. Um, occasionally, somebody will start off with a mass in the breast, which is misdiagnosed as a triple negative breast cancer, and it's really a metastatic carcinoid. I've seen that happen a few times. And there also seems to be an increased risk of adenocarcinoma of the breast in people who have a carcinoid tumor. So if somebody has a neuroendocrine tumor and has a mass in the breast, it needs to get evaluated like any other mass in the breast. And if you have a solid mass sitting in your breast, it deserves a needle biopsy to determine if this is a breast cancer or a metastasis. For metastasis, you don't really have to worry too much because whatever treats metastasis every place else will treat that as well. But if it's a primary breast cancer, you don't want to miss such a thing. Um, with respect to the estrogen receptors, it's a very confusing thing because breast cancer often has so-called neuroendocrine differentiation, and when you do staining with the immunohistochemistry that Dr. Tang was talking about, you could find chromogranin and synaptophysin immunostains positive on breast cancer, on ordinary breast cancer. If it's up to 50% of the cells having that staining, it's called adenocarcinoma of the breast, with neuroendocrine uh, differentiation, and it's treated just like breast cancer. When you get up to 51, anything more than 50%, it's recognized in the current staging classification of WHO as being an entity called neuroendocrine carcinoma of the breast, and that's a, called another disease, but it's only based on the percentage of cells having neuroendocrine differentiation, so it's very confused, and I'm sure that um, eventually will change when there's better molecular information about these tumors. Okay, um, my primary is in the ileum, but I have met to the pancreas. Does the survival rate statistics for pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors apply to me, or do I still count as being an intestinal carcinoid? We, we just submitted a paper on this. Uh, we have uh, 11 patients who have s synchronous or metachronous, what that means, same time of having small bowel and pancreas neuroendocrine tumors. Um, and what we did is, most of these were resected, and we did molecular testing using RNA markers and immunistic chemistry. And in two-thirds of those cases, the lesion in the pancreas came from the small bowel. But in a third of the cases, they were just pri they developed as a separate tumor. So in the patients, so our conclusion from that is in patients where they've had a metastasis from the small bowel, it's probably like any other metastatic site. Um, but if it's a primary tumor in the pancreas, uh, then it will probably behave more like a peanut. And when we looked at liver mets from many of these patients, uh, you know, many of the liver mets were from the pancreatic origin. So, and the pancreas will probably do a little bit worse than the small bowel. Also, there's uh, some lymph nodes, as you know, around the pancreas. Some sometimes during the fetal development, those lymph nodes got embedded into the pancreas tissue. And those patients, when they have a, in reality, lymph node metastasis, they, but on imaging study, they can look like they have a pancreas primary. And so that's a, something to be remembering, is sometimes an intraparenchymal lymph node can be metastasized from any small intestinal lesion. Yeah, that's a very important point that Ezar makes because some of those lymph nodes, as they travel up the superior mesenteric artery, will be right behind the pancreas. So we've had a number of patients who have come to us as being pancreatic primaries because they had an endoscopic ultrasound that biopsied this thing near the pancreas. It was billed as a pancreatic neuroendocrine tumor, but it was immediately evident to us that these were lymph nodes. And the, the 11 patients I mentioned did not fit into that category. They were clearly separate pancreatic primaries. Okay, here's a question addressed to Dr. Uh, Meyer. 
Is there a link between pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors and adenocarcinoma of the colon? Doctor, how uh, would you like to answer this? No, I'd like Renuka to answer it. Uh, not that, not that I'm aware of. Me neither. Uh, the biggest link that I've seen is that the screening colonoscopy is becoming pretty common, and very often uh, physicians will put the scope into the um, end of the ileum, into the small intestine, a little bit because it's, the opening is um, connected to the colon. And sometimes you could find a colon cancer in the colon and a small intestine carcinoid at the end of the ileum, the so-called distal ileum. So I've had several patients with that, but I'm not sure that there's a direct connection. Okay. We've seen a bunch of cases of simultaneous renal cell and uh, small bowel neuroendocrine, but renal cell is pretty common in the population, and when we looked at our percentage of patients, total patients that had renal cell, it was about the same as the normal population, but we have about eight to 10 patients who've had both, and we thought that was striking, but it's really no higher than the national incidence. Right, there, there are reports, um, sort of anecdotal reports, really, of people with um, HNPCC who have both um, bowel, carcin bowel uh, carcinomas, and then in the same person or in the same family have a carcinoid, so that may be part of that syndrome conceivably. It isn't really established as a formal. Of the colon. Some patients have presented with a mixed adenoneuroendocrine of the colon, so both sets of cells turned malignant. And in terms of therapy, we sort of treat the more aggressive histology. Okay. We have been told that when diagnosed with a grade one primary tumor that um, is present, that the same characteristics will be present in the metastases in the liver. Do you worry that the metastases in the liver are going to turn into grade three? We've written on this. Uh, it's very uncommon for a grade one to be a grade three in the liver, but it's not uncommon for a grade one to be a grade two in the liver. And we've shown that uh, the prognosis of the patient is related to the highest grade that you find. But it, there was very rare to see a grade three. So it's, a, it's usually more of a grade one to grade two. Right. So it would really take a, uh, an extra um, mutation or a couple of mutations to turn a low-grade tumor or, uh, into a high-grade tumor like that. So it's, it is rare. We've all seen occasional cases, and I know Dr. Hafdenerson talked about it before, that he did a biopsy and it was a small cell high-grade tumor that uh, had developed in the liver. But that's extraordinarily rare and not something that I would expect routinely and not something that you should even worry about um, as a routine. Okay. The, the other thing is that not all the pathologists have the same experience and expertise. So if you have some doubt at all about the pathology discrepancy, one won't hurt to go to a medical center with, with a good pathologist can review the slide again and to reevaluate the pathology. That's always the case, yes. Okay, here, this is addressed to Dr. Wang. Um, when do you remove the ileocecal valve? What conditions require cutting out an ileocecal valve? If the tumor is sitting right on the ileocecal valve, I don't have choice. I have to take it. Otherwise, I preserve all the ileocecal valve if just the cecum is not contaminated by the blue dye. When I inject the blue dye, if the blue dye did not go to the cecum, I will save the ileocecal valve. And sometimes I just have to do a hands on osmosis. Even only one centimeter of terminium left, I can still save the ileocecal valve, technically. Okay. Any other thoughts? Well, I think any anytime the tumor is near where the small intestine meets the large intestine, you're going to lose the ileocecal valve, unless you go to the lengths that Dr. Wang does. Okay. Is operability clear cut, or does it depend on the skill of the surgeon? <laughs> Is operability a clear cut concept, or does operability depend on the skill of the surgeon? Something? <laughs> uh, that is a tough question. <laughs> to me, I was criticized, as a matter of fact, when I first I presented this kind of, of stuff. I was taught, uh, one of the professors from Harvard stood up and said, do you know you're doing forbidden surgery? 
And my answer was, if something been forbidden for the last 50 years, if we don't evaluate how we make it progress. The second thing is, if you don't have any good alternative, what I did wrong by giving someone a chance. So it's kind of a different thing you, you look at it. I smell one of the professor uh, also criticized me. I say, I'm doing a mid-air bungee jump when I'm doing those kind of high-risk procedure in the operating room. He think I was a cowboy stunt doing something could endanger patients live in the operating room. But when I had established enough data to present a national conference, the next time he saw me, he said, you owe me drinks. I said, what, what do you mean I owe you drinks? He said, because I was the one irritate you, give you the most negative comment. I'm the one motivate you to go home to work harder to come back to prove me wrong. So you owe me drinks. So I bought him three <laughs> drinks. <laughs> So just to answer the, the same question, I mean, I think operability uh, depends, you know, on the feeling of the surgeon uh, and their confidence in their ability to take something out. And that can vary very widely from one person to another one. Um, for example, some people don't believe that taking out the primary tumor in the face of metastatic disease is worthwhile. And I would submit that many medical oncologists feel that way. <coughs> Whereas surgeons who specialize in neuroendocrine tumors generally, by and large, don't feel that way. So you can get a lot of mixed messages depending on who you talk to. But I think it's important to talk to somebody who's comfortable doing those procedures and, in, and is familiar with, you know, even uh, doing hepatic cyto reduction because uh, otherwise you're going to get many people with neuroendocrine tumors are going to get the answer that they're, quote, inoperable. Okay, and as a, a non-surgeon, let me just throw out that it's really um, not a very good exercise to try to force a surgeon to do a, sur a surgery that he feels technically incapable of doing and feels he's just going to open and close and not accomplish anything and it's hopeless. And you keep insisting on surgery, I think it's more important to get opinions from other possibly more experienced surgeons who may have other techniques and other approaches and may find that it actually is operable when the um, local surgeon felt it was inoperable. So, just, uh, it's a relative concept, and it never hurts to get a, another opinion if in doubt. Yeah, as I you know, alluded in my talk, you know, right now, 90% of patients come to me with a quote unquote inoperable tumor. So it's a relative term. You know, some people look and say it's absolutely impossible. Some people look and say, I may give it a try. From my experience as a medical oncologist, where you get patients that have come from hospitals that are not necessarily doing a lot of multidisciplinary care of neuroendocrine cancer patients, um, debulking surgery, for example, the surgeons there may say, this is stage four, how am I going to be of help to you? And they may say no, but when they come and see um, Dr. Howe's friend, who is my partner, Dr. Kushinov, he would say, no, I think I can help this person. And, and so I think that's where there is truly a difference. And the difference is largely because the person that saw you or saw the patient first is just not doing as much multidisciplinary care. And they're not familiar with their role in, in, in an advanced setting. And sometimes it's truly controversial. High-grade neuroendocrine or higher-grade neuroendocrine, sometimes the surgeons say, you know what, I don't want to operate. I want to see the biology. I want to give this a little time before I make a decision. Because there may be a role in a higher grade tumor for surgery, but the textbook answer is you shouldn't operate. So I think I just wanted to point out that there are some differences that are truly related to someone's experience. But some differences are purely because we don't know the biology, and it's really controversial whether you should operate or not. OK. At what size um, liver tumor do you start feeling a, an obligation to do something about it? Is there a certain size that's critical? What size? Liver. What size liver tumor do you need to do something is the question. Well, it, it's uh, also having a look at rare state. It's location, location, location. So the tumor, like in sitting in hepatic hilum, in, in approaching the vessel go to the liver, even a small tumor, sometimes I say, maybe I should consider to operate on a little bit earlier. If the tumor is rooted out at the mesentery, already encasing on the vessel, and the patient already shows sign of intestinal ischemia, you know, has a, and a, and a pain after eating, 
And those patients I may take on much earlier to prevent they get into a crisis with a coming with a hosp to the hospital with an emergency ab abdomen, acute abdomen with bowel necrosis. Okay, so the size of the tumor is less important than the location and the liver function and what is happening. If the tumor is blocking blood vessels, if it's blocking bile ducts, if it's threatening to do so in the near future, the liver is a vital organ. You have to have it to live. Um, and you have to do something about those things, but it's possible to live with a remarkably big liver, like some of the pictures that we saw earlier, for years and years and years if it's not causing problems and the tumors aren't increasing. But if you have a liver full of tumor and they're getting bigger and bigger and bigger, um, it's a, a certainly a major problem. And yeah, I, 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 I agree that size isn't really an important criteria. It's really the number of lesions and the distribution of lesions and whether it's, it's going to be amenable to cytoreduction. reduction. I mean, you can have some people get by with a 15 centimeter tumor and they're, you know, they can, they can hang out with that for a long time and uh, other people with, you know, 10 one centimeter tumors. And so it's, it's really the distribution number in, in, in sizes and whether we decide to do that. Okay. When we see a 10 year survival chart, is that based on 10 year old technology? Are current survival rates even better? Yes and yes. <laughs> And uh, so sometimes the follow-up um, for some of the newer trials is just not there. So we don't yet know the impact of some of the newer therapies that, you know, we, we just started using not that long ago. And yes, survival has improved. And um, we think it is largely from the access to more options because just 10 years ago, we had just sandostatin, and now we have so many more options. So yes, survival has improved, and for 10 years survival, your doctor needs to be old enough to follow you and uh, for 10 years, and uh, yes. Okay, here's an unusual question. Is MVOT, that means multivisceral organ transplant, part of the protocol? I don't see it on this year's agenda. Yeah, I think, Yizar, you guys at, in Louisiana have referred patients for that. Uh, you probably have more experience than anybody up here. Uh, in the last uh, few years, I have personally involved and referred about 10 patients for that particular procedure. The criteria is very difficult to, to make a choice, and you have to put everything into context, so to speak. Uh, you have to see what the disease location is, what the patient general condition is. Usually, my recommendation is younger patient with the disease only limited to the abdomen and it's already completely encasing the blood supply to the intestinal, to the pancreas, to the liver. In that area, I don't have any other better option to address that issue than I refer patient for the, the motor organ transplant patient. The way they, they do this procedure is they stay, they don't even go to the abdomen. They stay outside of the abdomen. They basically peel off the peritoneum off. If I put it, uh, the, the explanation is if you think the abdominal cavity is a like garbage can, and then inside of the garbage can, you have the garbage bag that your peritoneum, and inside of the garbage bag, you have all the garbage that's intestine, pancreas, and everything. So we operate on patients, we open out the garbage can, and we open the garbage bag to, to deal with the garbage inside of the, 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 the abdomen. But uh, on multi organ transplant surgeon, they do it, they don't even open up the, the plastic bag. They open up the, the, the plastic can and they toss the whole plastic bag out and they put a new organ in. So the way they do it, they just put a, a clamp on the, the, on the cava, the blood go, go back to your heart and put a clamp on, come back from the artery from your heart and they just plug the new organ to this artery and vein. So, they don't have to worry about anything else. And the only thing they have to do is they hook up your, your rectum, hook up your esophagus, they're done with you. So technically, <laughs> they basically, they're not fi fixing the, 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 the speaker or antenna or anything. They just take the whole TV out, throw the whole TV out. They plug the, the plug into the, the power line, they hook up the antenna, then you got new, new whole set organ. This, this, That's this, how they do it. Certainly not a uh, thing which is uh, done very often and is a, this, this is a procedure where you take out the entire 
guts, everything in the abdomen is, is discarded. You remove the entire liver, the entire pancreas, the entire colon, the entire small intestine, all the blood vessels, everything that's in the abdomen is thrown away and then you transplant a whole new abdominal contents from a cadaver transplant and then you have to hook up all the plumbing, all the blood vessels, all the um, urinary things, everything has to get hooked up again and then you have new guts and then you have to be on immunosuppression so you don't reject this transplant like a kidney transplant, you have to be on immunosuppression. After this, you need immunosuppression. It's an extraordinarily radical procedure, which would require very, very highly selected patients. And if you had even the tiniest little cancer someplace else, it's likely to grow back very quickly um, as a result of immunosuppression. So it's certainly not something that is done every day. And um, I think we have other things that are more useful for more people, that's for sure. But it is something which is out there and I think should, you know, for highly selected people, may have a role. Okay, um, we have five more minutes and a bunch of questions, so let's try to go through as quickly as we can. Do you think it's advisable to get a CAT scan every year or two for a healthy person as a preventive measure to can catch cancer early? I don't think there's any evidence that that's going to work and you get um, radiation exposure and you can have a cancer I mean, just as a general thing to do, just to have CAT scans every year is not something that currently we're recommending. Um, there's another, um, can we get printouts of the slides from any of the speakers? I think that there's going to be a, um, um, materials like that are going to become available. Stay in touch with Bob um, Mwaman and um, Marianne and uh, we'll be able to get those things after the conference. So the answer is yes. Um, is it good to sign up for care everywhere for people that have EPIC? It's a wonderful thing to sign up for care everywhere if you're seeing multiple doctors and they all have the same medical record system and could have access to all of the data. So I think that is good. The problem is that only about a third of um, hospitals are using EPIC and for the ones who don't, you can't um, share in that. Okay, um, Dr. Wang, is it always possible to resect all metastatic cancerous lymph nodes. I guess always is a pretty strong word. Our goal is to try to achieve as much as, as we can. And I, I explained to the patient, say, if you have $100 for 100 kids for Christmas gift, it's a budget, so one kid can get $1. If you can remove 90 kids, only 10 kids left, then each kid will get $10. If you can remove 99 kids, only one kid and get $100. So if I can debug as much tumor as possible, then when Dr. Warren gives the same medicine, even the same amount of medicine, so have more medicine go to the, to, the, to the tumor in terms of ratio. Okay, to anyone, how important it is to find the primary site of the tumor and uh, how relevant is it if the tumor is already metastatic? I think it's very relevant. Uh, if it's a small bowel primary uh, and you just treat the patient medically, the patient you know, may at some point develop a bowel obstruction or problems from the, the tumor growing. They can get peritoneal metastases. Um, and also knowing where it came from can inform treatment. Treatments for, uh, are, that we have for pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors are better than what we have for small bowel neuroendocrine tumors in terms of medical therapy. So I think it's important. You can learn a lot from the tumor itself. Uh, you can do certain immunohistochemical markers from a liver biopsy and often figure out if it's from the pancreas or small bowel um, or from the lung. So, and, and that will change your treatment. So I think it is important. Okay, I think that um, I agree with the general concept. I think there's some individual exceptions where somebody might have a, a primary that's a couple of millimeters across and asymptomatic and somebody has uh, overwhelming metastatic disease in the liver which is highly symptomatic that may need to be treated um, right off the bat and it may be that uh, the surgical procedure to uh, take out the gallbladder and take out the primary and uh, do whatever is outside the liver can be done just a little bit later. If you have a massive metastatic pancreatic neuroendocrine tumor, for example, that's you know this big around, you may want to start with uh, capecitabine and temozolomide or, and some other things, and then. But if it was a small bowel, would you? No, that would do not that? apply to a small bowel. A small bowel lesion, that, that was a pancreatic example, but a small bowel lesion, same concept. If you had massive. Would you give a finitor or, or embolize it. 
probably in that case um, give them a metastatin em analog and embolize if you wanted a really quick response and it was clearly inoperable and then save the primary resection for later. You would agree with that? But, you know, the, those data can be obtained from a liver biopsy, not with 100% certainty, but with about 85%. And a lot of, a lot of hospitals aren't doing this, but uh, if anybody's interested, our, our cytopathologist, Andrew Belizzi, is really good at this, and we've written several papers on, uh, you know, being able to identify the tumor of unknown primary uh, by using immunistic chemistry. I know that Dr. Waltering's group uses a biotherapeutics uh, cancer ID test, uh, which can also be very helpful, and that's uh, commercially available. So those are some other things that can be done to, to try to figure it out. My surgery was done almost 10 years ago. Do pathology departments keep um, surgery slides for review and for analysis 10 years later? The slides can be still be, be reviewed by any pathologist, uh, but unfortunately, most of the, the tissue block has been, been uh, discarded. So when I was doing pathology the year, it was seven years we had to, to re reserve it, but I, th I think the rule has been changing now, so they don't preserve the tissue as long as in the past. Okay. What are the statistics regarding complications of resecting a small bowel primary in mesenteric masses and liver cytoreduction? It's usually it's a very safe procedure, and uh, you know, with experience, we getting better, learn how to do this procedure more, more effectively and safely, and. Uh, but as a surgeon, you never say never because God will going to penalize you. You say, I never have complications, though. So. Okay. Do lungoids, I guess, uh, neuroendocrine tumors of the lung who've had primary tumor removed need monitoring in the years post-op? The answer is generally yes with all neuroendocrine tumors. How much monitoring and how uh, frequently, how long, depends on the stage of the cancer and the grade of the cancer and other features. But I would say even in... Um, a simple um, resected node negative neuroendocrine tumor of the lung, it's not unreasonable to do a CT chest once a year. How long that should go, nobody knows, but it is possible to have recurrences even 10 or 15 years later, although the vast majority of people are cured with surgery in that case. Okay. Um, just a, okay. Should we do the last two? Okay. Um, High-dose somatostatin analogs, doses greater than 30 milligrams of uh, triotide LAR or 120 milligrams of lanreotide. Um, should you use extra high dose in order to achieve a target um, blood level, which is therapeutic by uh, blood level measurement? It's not generally measured. And they've done studies to look to see what is the exposure, whether, like for example, with the sandostatin shots, if it didn't go in the muscle and it went in, you know, for example, subcute tissue. But more or less, once you've been on it for a long time, you do generally have steady state levels. Um, but in terms of using higher doses, um, uh, in the past, when we didn't have other therapeutic options, yes, I, we had one paper looking at the higher doses, more frequent dosing, and to see whether that helped control the disease. And it appeared that there was a bias towards patients having a little bit better disease control when they were, uh, I'm talking about tumor progression control, not just symptom control, um, when they were on higher doses or more frequent doses. But now that we have more options available to actually debulk the cancer or try to even shrink it, um, people generally move to that as opposed to just increasing the dose. I think the data we have from the Netter 1 PRRT trial is very valuable. The people on that randomized trial that did not get PRRT with lutetium-177 dotatate, the control group on that trial, received 60 milligrams of octreotide LIR. The, the dose was doubled. So everybody who went on uh, the, that clinical trial, we'll talk about more tomorrow, everybody progressed on octreotide LIR 30 milligrams every four weeks. Everybody progressed. So what happened was half of the people got 60 milligrams instead, 
and half the people got the PRRT with radioactive triatide. The people that got a doubling of the dose had very little benefit, and the average time for major tumor progression was 8.4 months in the people that got a double dose, and that was a 20% increase in the size of the tumors by um, eight months. So I think that the chances of having a really meaningful benefit for cancer control is not very high. So the main reason for increasing the dose beyond the standard recommended dose is for controlling symptoms of carcinoid syndrome or hormone secretion syndromes, and you could go as high as you need for controlling symptoms. Um, there is some data about um, effectiveness with optimizing blood levels. Dr. Waltering certainly has data like that. And I think that especially in the days before we had generally available PRRT and other modalities, that that was um, probably a greater day-to-day -day significance than it is today. Okay, I think that's all the time we have for questions. Thank you very, very much. And um, look forward to uh, seeing you at the evening events and uh, tomorrow. Thank you. <laughs>